No new phone from Samsung announced at this year's Mobile World Congress, but we have got a new tablet, or perhaps phablet. This is an eight inch tablet. You can put a SIM card in it. You can actually put this to your ear and make phone calls if you want to. But in reality, people are gonna use it and the little S Pen that they provide with it uh, to navigate apps. Neat trick they can do here, you can split the screen into two jobs at once. So say you've got your calendar open already and you want to watch a video, just drag it into place and the screen will split. So if I want to watch this uh, triathlon footage, it will run in the bottom half of the screen. If I turn it through to become in this mode, I could actually decide to run that as a pop-out player, and that would superimpose anywhere on the page, and I can resize it, double-click on it though, and it will go absolutely full frame. The quality of this, although perhaps not ideal under these kind of exhibition conditions, take my word for it, it's right up there with the retina display that Apple would offer. It's an interesting device, uh, this too, in terms of its price point. It's not coming to market until about April, perhaps May this year. But Samsung tell me it's going to be cheaper than an iPad mini. Fellow Koreans LG also had new handsets out with additional members of the Optimus L family. The new version of the L3, the L3 II, has been praised by reviewers as a well-equipped smartphone for a bargain basement price. Huawei reinforced its place, along with fellow Chinese company ZTE, as the fast-growing companies in the world of mobile, with rapidly growing reputations, and this year say Huawei, the fastest phone on the planet. And Sony followed its CES unveiling of their new Xperia Z phone with a complimentary tablet. Lighter to handle than many at this size, a 10.1-inch screen in a carbon fibre case, fantastic quality display, and the latest Android Jelly Bean OS. And talking of operating systems. This is the clue to it. It's that little badge there. You remember it? Mozilla Firefox. A very popular browser, both on Macintosh and desktop computers. Well, now the same people have devised an entire operating system for mobile phones. It's been written in HTML5, the modern code you use behind the most modern websites. And the idea is, it's open source, anyone can play with it, adapt it, and use it. You go to the phone like this, and it's got the familiar sort of layout. You can make calls, you can send texts, and of course, you can browse the web. But they've already got on this demo unit just a handful of apps. But already it's got dozens of developers working on apps for this phone, and its target is not really your iPhone user, or your high-end Samsung, or whatever. This is designed for people who want a smartphone experience for something less than half the smartphone price. The Firefox OS that was announced yesterday is actually probably the big news for Mobile World Congress uh, this week. So we've been working with Mozilla for a year now, along with Qualcomm, to try and build the true internet on your mobile. And the advantage of that is completely open ecosystem, allows you to bring more of what you enjoy on the internet to your mobile phone and do it in a really cost-effective way, which means that more and more people will have access to smartphones at lower price points. But you have to ask why. I mean, Apple have its walled garden and hugely successful. Android seems to be ruling the world. Modest contributions from BlackBerry and from Nokia and Windows 8. Is there really room for another OS? Well, I think the key here is choice. People understand the internet. They've already made decisions about what works, what they enjoy. Bringing that to life on their mobile phone is giving a really enhanced choice to consumers. But also, it's on their terms because it's an open system. So I think it is a great chance of making a big impact. It's a classic show story, really. It's a brand new operating system. It's really interesting. It's great, from my point of view, to see something new. But I mean, if you're a consumer thinking about buying a new phone, this is quite a long way off, it has to be said. And uh, you've got companies like Microsoft really struggling to make headway with things like Windows Phone, with millions and millions of dollars of marketing budget behind it. If those guys are struggling, good luck Firefox.
Also backing the new OS was the Finnish phone giant Nokia, in that they had their HEAR mapping system available on the new platform. But they had their own fish, or rather phones, to fry too. Their boss, Stephen Elop, was in Barcelona to announce new mid-range and dead cheap handsets to complement the high-end Lumia phones. Now indeed what we've done is taken some of the great experiences available in our flagship products. We've done the hard engineering necessary to take elements of that and put it on lower priced devices. Now you can't take everything from the top and move it onto those lower products, but you can certainly create a whole family of products that take you nicely through the capabilities. From the basic capabilities and some of those points of differentiation to a full-fledged environment on a Lumia 920. But there must be a risk that if I get a good experience from a $200 phone, mm -hmm. why do I fork out for the $400 or $500 phone? Because we're delivering even better experiences on the $400 or $500 well, like what? phone. What are you doing? Pardon me? What are you doing? What, 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 so, what's driving me to that high-end phone? So, for example, the Lumia 920 as a product that we introduced just before Christmas is still the only Lumia smartphone that has optical image stabilization. So when my hand is shaking, that lens is moving against it. That's something that's not available on the other devices. So it's an example of one thing that's only available in the highest end. While many of the digital lenses we have, where you can take pictures and modify those images in real time, those, those uh, digital lenses we've been able to take to lower price points. So it's a mix of things, but of course the highest priced devices have some of the leading features. Okay, now you came to Nokia from Microsoft. You have forged a relationship with Microsoft and the Windows 8 ecosystem. So we take it as read, the phones are good, and I mm -hmm. think most of the critics say they're good. Yes. But they're not selling in the volumes you'd like, are they? Well, we always want to sell more volumes. That's, that's certainly the case. At this point, for example, with the 920, we're still in a situation where demand is exceeding supply and our expectations. So from that perspective, we're very pleased with what we're hearing from consumers. But we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep making more people aware. We have to make sure that a salesperson in a retail store knows to properly present or how to present a Lumia product next to some of the products they've been selling you know, more frequently over the last couple of years. This is Martin Stanford at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. You know the problem when you're traveling, you've got a phone in one hand, you've got to keep that charged up, and maybe a tablet you like to use, you want them both to connect to the internet. Well, ASUS at this year's show have come up with a brand new idea to get around that problem. They call it the pad phone Infinity. The, these two devices, they are, they are all the full HD panel. So, 5 inch and 10 inch, you can see when I put inside the resolution, the best scenario to the end users. Who do you think is your perfect customer? Who's that device aimed at? All the, our customer right now, we had this 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. They almost occupy 25, 25, 25 percent of the customer. You know, almost the same. Because the people, they use the smartphone. Once the people want to, they want to enjoy the tablet scenario, this is the best solution. You know why? Because this is LTE phone. When I put inside, this LTE tablet, always on, always connected. Keeping our phones and tablets powered up can be a challenge. There were numerous solutions on show. Battery cases from the likes of Mophie and wireless charging from a New Zealand-based newcomer, Proxy. With help from manufacturers, they say this kind of surface or a bin-like container can refresh not only phones but also remote controls or toys. And Duracell PowerMat had new ideas on offer too. In a battery case, okay, similar to other battery cases in the market, so that by press of the button, you can basically power up your phone throughout okay, the day. Okay, we get the little indicator light on the back there, yeah? Yes, right? yes. Okay. And That's not the end of the story though. Absolutely, it's only the beginning. It's 1950 milliamps, so practically doubles the power. The nice thing about it, if you go out at night and you don't want the full chubby phone, you can still remain with the slick case. And the common to both of them is that they both charge wirelessly on any enabled Duracell PowerMet surface, such as those. So if I want to charge those, all I need to do is put them and they will charge. Okay, so far easier handling, I can put them separately, together, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever I want, on every Duracell PowerMat surface they charge. It gets even better. I have this mat, which, just like our other mat, it, you can put your phone on it and charge. Only, it has no cords. So, by press of the button here, I activate and I get a full charge. Out of this 4,200 milliamps battery, I can carry it with me wherever I go. 
And just like that, in the garden, in the plane, wherever I am, it gives me a charge with no cords. So here's a dilemma. You take your mobile phone or your iPad or other tablet outside. Can you really see it that well? Apical from the UK have got a solution to that problem. Mike Tush is here. Mike, tell us what you've done. Well, we've taken a new approach to this problem, which is a fundamental problem for all displays, in the sense that if you're in a dark room, uh, you can watch a movie or play a game quite happily, but we aren't normally in a dark room. Uh, we're often in uh, quite bright conditions, actually. We're sitting on a, on a fairly sunny day here, and I'd quite like to watch a movie on my device. It's a portable device, after all. Um, it's very difficult to make that happen because screens really suffer in, uh, in uh, ambient light. They reflect light, and our eyes actually adapt differently. So it's a fundamental problem that can't really be solved just by improving pixels or changing the glass on the display. Uh, we've come up with a new approach, it's based on understanding how the eye works and it's digital processing uh, which actually adapts the content to the display and the result is actually we could watch a movie under these conditions very happily okay, and actually this is what we're showing. So, so actually here's a device, um, I've got, I've got a, a, a TV program here that I'd like to watch and uh, I'll just play it here and uh, I think you can probably see this is quite watchable. Um, it's not normally what you'd expect. You wouldn't normally be expected to seeing a, a film under these conditions, um, but I can see it quite, quite happily. I haven't boosted the power of this device. Actually, I'm using less battery than I would normally. I've actually reduced the display brightness, but because I've compensated for it digitally, I can get a very good experience. And in fact, if I turn off our processing, it's, I don't know if you can see, it's looks completely Almost black. Almost disappeared, you, hasn't it? You could never watch this. And that uh, would be the native ability of that that's what, platform without your technology. That's what I'd get out of the box if I, if I used this device today. Okay. And just by uh, enabling some, I guess, clever processing inside, uh, I get a great multimedia experience anywhere and it's done automatically. So uh, the ambient light sensor in the device automatically picks up my viewing conditions, adapts the display to what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and I see roughly the same experience in a dark room and in a bright sunny day. Britain had more exhibitors in Barcelona than any other country. Some mere startups who won the chance to go to Mobile World Congress in a competition run by UK Trade and Industry. Five companies got through to a final runoff. The Culture Minister Ed Vesey was on hand to present the first prize to Open Signal. So we crowdsource data on the performance and coverage of mobile networks all around the world. So for consumers, we help them get better signal by recommending the best network in their particular area. And for mobile operators, we offer them a data intelligence service to understand and optimize their networks. By the power of the same data, we offer an app which helps them get better signal in real time. So for example, we point in the direction of your current signal. So if you're dropping a call or experiencing problems, you can walk in that direction to get better signal. More than 70 companies entered this competition. There is only one winner, but as the old cliche goes, it's actually true in this case, uh, all the finalists really were winners because they all got a chance to work with mentors. They all got a chance to showcase their wares to a much wider audience. Is it government money well spent? Some may say, if an idea is good enough, it'll succeed anyway. It's a good question. I mean, I've been round with UKTI and met a lot of companies that have told me how useful UKTI has been to them. I'm not sure whether they were prepped beforehand, they certainly sounded genuine. And I think what UKTI offers is a fantastic one-stop shop. So if you're a company that wants to grow and export into markets, you can go to UKTI and get some great advice. And also if you're a company that's going global and wants to have a European headquarters, UK has to compete with other countries. UKTI works incredibly well in bringing companies into the UK. So I think it is money really well spent actually. Mobile payments was another theme of the show with web payments giant PayPal having small traders in mind. The small businesses uh, can't accept credit cards really easily. First of all it's very expensive you have to open a merchant account and sign all kinds of paperwork and then you've got monthly fees and the device uh, to accept credit cards is really expensive. It's uh, hundreds of pounds and um, so what we announce and, and, and launch is PayPal here for chip and pin countries and starting with the UK where any small merchant can now accept credit cards and other forms of electronic payments including PayPal from our very big user base uh, in the UK of 20 million users and they can actually accept credit cards by simply uh, pairing that device with their smartphone and everybody has a smartphone these days and it's Bluetooth and uh, they run the app on their smartphone 
end, which is here, um, and, um, and then the customer can insert their credit card in this terminal, type their PIN code, and the payment is done. And it's portable, so if you're a, a flea market seller or if you're on the go and you're doing deliveries, you can use that uh, new device that accepts payments uh, on the go for very little fees. So let's give this a try then. I want to buy a cover for my mobile phone, but I haven't got any money on me. With this NFC enabled phone, that's not a problem. So I go to the control panel here. It says press go to start. So that's quite simple, isn't it? Let's now choose an item, number 23. The charge is one euro. I haven't got that in coins, so I'm just going to touch the phone nearby and the one euro has already gone. If we now have a look at number 23 on the rack, the motors whirl. I reach down inside the machine and my new phone cover. Simple as that. Visa had announced a tie-up with Samsung to include this NFC capability in all their new handsets. So as a consumer, before I go and make my first contactless payment or purchase, what do I have to do? What relationship do I have to establish with Visa? So you'll buy one of these handsets and you'll contact your financial institution. Uh, those who are participating. That's a bank, in that's plain a, speaking, isn't it? It's, it's, yes. it's a bank. Uh, it can also be some other <laughs> I know, entities. I understand. But, okay. but by and large, yeah. the vast majority of banks. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you'll contact them. Uh, those who are participating will make available to you uh, their mobile payment application, uh, which will allow you to download your personal details onto this applet that's sitting on your phone. And you'll then be able to use it anywhere you see the visa sign and the contactless symbol. So across Europe today, that's 600,000 terminals. By the end of this year, it'll be around about 700,000 terminals. If this is going to roll out right across the industry, if I'm a shopkeeper, I don't want to install different gadgets for different people. Will it work with my bank card or your card or a MasterCard? So we're all about interoperability and standards. Uh, so this will never work if we try and do things on a proprietary basis. Uh, and that's why we work actually with the other payment schemes to have standards so that a retailer can install one terminal in the knowledge that whatever's presented to them, as long as it uses that industry standard, it will work properly. But PayPal reject NFC as unnecessary. Well, we have a contrarian point of view on NFC, actually. We feel that it doesn't really solve a customer problem. Because today, you know, you never go and pay with your credit card and say, you know, I wish somebody came up with something better. Because it's easy. It's easy enough to pay with cash or with credit cards. And we think that the companies really focusing only on the payments experience at the point of sale are missing the point. What we believe in is location-based payments. So you pull up your smartphone with your PayPal app. Um, and uh, you look at the stores around you, in, in this case, a coffee shop, and you can order your coffee before you get there and skip the line altogether. And that's value for you because you don't want to wait for 20 minutes to get a coffee. You can get it in two, and technology can do that and offer you personalized service because you're greeted by name when your coffee is ready. With paying for things sorted, how about a little high-tech advertising? Augmented reality continues to move on a pace with software freely available for app developers to use. Lego has given their catalogue extra engagement. And that involvement is useful for teaching too. As you can hear now, to, um, to work on an education application that helps kids recognise words. So what we have here is the kids get the opportunity of selecting from a number of words in the, uh, in the list on the right hand side. I've chosen the word cereal. That's now gone into the Wordoscope. And the kids now have the opportunity of walking around maybe their kitchen at home, recognizing a number of those words or pointing at a number of words. The application then scans the words. And then I get a congratulations, I found the word cereal. So you can imagine a very engaging experience with the kids working with augmented reality. At the Ford stand at Mobile World Congress, that says something, doesn't it? A motor company is here. This is Paul Mascarena. So I'm sitting in a brand new car with Paul with the latest tech, which includes what? This is our brand new Ford EcoSport vehicle. It's a really adventurous, fun to drive little vehicle. And it features a, a feature called AppLink, uh, which lets you run your applications on your mobile phone. Uh, interface with them in the vehicle and uh, for example here we're running uh, an app called Spotify streaming music 
Uh, you can see that we're live and we're playing playing some nice music. You like that? That's <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, so we have we have in our vehicles a in-car connectivity system called Sync, uh, which lets you come in, hook up your mobile device, make and receive phone calls, play music, uh, access other content on the device. Layered on top of that, we're launching a feature called AppLink, um, which lets you run various apps, whether it's streaming music, uh, news, magazine articles, other information services in the vehicle, to do it all safely while you're driving, keep your hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, well, let me ask using you, voice commands. Let me ask yeah. you about the safety. How right. do you make sure that kind of interaction with the vehicle is safe? So, obviously as a driver, the, the prime thing is to stay focused on driving. Uh, we say hands on the wheel, eyes on the road. Um, the safest way to interface is to use voice commands. So Sync has got a platform um, which is built around voice commands, whether it's making or receiving phone calls, whether it's playing music, whether it's accessing the apps on the vehicle. Um, AppLink is the enabler to make all of that happen. So it's seamless as far as the customer is concerned, but it lets them stay focused on driving. And do I have to have my mobile phone with me, or does this car have a SIM card? No, you, we, we use the phone. The reason that we use the phone is there's no separate subscription required. You've already got the content on your device. You carry it with you at all times. It connects very easily using either Bluetooth or using a, a USB cord, as we are here. Mm -hmm. um, the advantage with the USB cord, of course, is you can charge the phone at the same time you're yeah. using the phone. Um, and it just seems to be a, a great solution for our customers. Straight Ford for also board. had its latest accident prevention technology on display, Five, preventing, they say, more an expensive and painful low-speed collisions. And the car stops all by itself. And their new cars will also assist with parallel parking. Right, let's try out the Active Park Assist system. I turn it on here. And now we imagine the situation, as you can see, that we're passing some parked cars, wondering if we'll fit in a gap, searching for a parking space. We come past, it says, yes, a parking space is found, but continue to drive forward. Right, now release the steering <laughs> and put it in reverse gear. So this is a kind of weird feeling. I'm controlling the car, backing up a bit, bit of clutch, bit of accelerator, but my hands are doing absolutely nothing. The car has taken over, doing this at, I hope, a sensible speed. Check surroundings, drive backwards, says the screen, which I am obediently doing. Drive forward, it says, okay. Into first gear, again, not touching the steering wheel at all. And forward we go, just a little bit. Straightens us up. Is it happy? It's happy. Active park completed. Job done. Well, that's it for this week. Don't forget you can catch up with all the tech stories on Sky News for iPad, our smartphone applications, and of course on skynews.com. Until next time, from Barcelona, goodbye.